This episode is called To Section 8 or To Not Section 8, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. And before I even start with the intro to it, I just want to make sure everyone's aware I'm not an attorney or representative of Section 8. So if you have any questions that require further clarification, please check with someone else. Welcome to the Investor Empowerment Series radio show, empowering your real estate investing with techniques, opportunities, and information, minus the BS and sales pitches. Now, please welcome the host of the Investor Empowerment Series, Joe Mueller from the Toughest Nails Investment Syndicate, Joe Mueller. Welcome back to the Investor Empowerment Series radio show, episode number 18, to section 8 or to not section 8, that is the question. Before we get started on some of my own personal beliefs on working with section 8 tenants, I just want to touch on something that I could possibly need some help with from you guys, and that is if you like what you're hearing on the podcast, please, please, please go on iTunes, leave me some feedback Please rate me on iTunes. We're also being played currently on Stitcher, which is the Android version, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Google Play, among some other avenues. You can actually hear the podcast. That would really help me out. I'm trying to offer some good information to help benefit the listeners out there. And unfortunately, when we converted uh, servers on our podcast about a month ago, I lost the 30 or so ratings and reviews I had at that point. So I'm kind of starting from scratch. So again, if you could please help me out, I'd appreciate it. Go on iTunes, find us under Investor Empowerment Series Radio Show, and give us a good rating if you like what you're hearing. If you don't like what you're hearing, I'm sorry to hear that, but I would appreciate your feedback on how I can make this podcast better. Also, if you know of anyone who's interested in possibly being a guest, please bring them to me. Please contact me directly through my email address which is the letter J, M as in Mary, U-E-L-L-E-R, at TanisGroupLLC.com, which is T as in Tom, A-N as in Nancy, I-S as in Sam, group, like group of people, LLC.com. I know it's a long name and it's a hard email to write down. You know, when I started this up, however many years ago, I wasn't really thinking that way. (laughs) And I didn't think I'd be handing it out as much as I need to nowadays. But again... I'm always looking to have some more guests on that have some experience in real estate or maybe don't have experience but are just getting started to create a different perspective for the listener on, you know, what it's like out there to be a real estate investor and, you know, potentially teach and grow together with some of the educational aspects that people have learned through experience in the real estate investing niche. That said, I'd like to get started on Section 8. So I was asked this question actually a couple weeks back by one of our investors and he's currently got a rental property in the area and he had a section eight tenant who was interested, wasn't really sure. He had never rented to a section eight tenant before, wasn't sure what to expect. So I'm going to lay out some of the guidelines that we see in the Chicago area, which of course could be different uh, depending on what part of the country you're listening from. But Uh, From my understanding, it's somewhat similar, the program throughout the country. You know, it does change by county and, you know, poverty level, city, things like that can change the way they run their programs, but it should be somewhat similar to what I'm going to describe right now. So to Section 8 or to not Section 8, the good, the bad, and the ugly. First of all, obviously everyone has heard that Section 8 is a guaranteed rental payment. I will tell you that uh, typically 99% of the time that is true. Um, One of the things you need to look out for when you're renting to a Section 8 tenant, though, is your first month's rent. Now, again, I'm I'm not an attorney. I'm not a representative of Section 8, but I can tell you what I've experienced. And that is, if you're looking for first month's rent and security deposit from a Section 8 tenant... That may be a little more challenging than from a a routine, we'll call them a retail tenant that you'll get through conventional marketing methods. And it really comes down to the person and the tenant themselves and their financial wherewithal and capability of saving money for that security deposit. In all the cases I have rented to Section 8 tenants, I don't think I've ever received a full one-month security deposit, which is what I require from any tenant. 
I have had to make concessions for the Section 8 tenants and put them either on payment plans or set a different dollar amount, which is typically less than one month's rent, in order to get a security deposit from them. That being said, when you're playing the Section 8 game, you know, it's, it's a government entity, essentially. Uh, everything takes more time. So if you've got a an apartment that you you have for rent and you've had the tenant apply, which you're going to follow the normal conventional application methods, you're going to do your normal background checks, you're going to check for criminal background, you're going to check with previous landlords, they don't get any type of extra consolidation from you as a Section 8 tenant, regardless of what you may hear. You're still entitled to do your complete and routine application process, and I would advise you to, to do so when you're renting to a Section 8 tenant. So back to what I was saying, if you've got someone who is going to rent an apartment from you, let's say on September 1st, and they apply on August 15th, you know, two weeks before they intend on moving in and you approve their application a few days later, that process to actually get your first month's rent payment can differ depending on which housing authority, which is the Section 8 governing body, is the housing authority. So that could be a, a county housing authority, it could be a city housing authority, and I imagine it could probably even be a state housing authority. Uh, depends on the area and where you're investing, where the property is located. But, again, you essentially have to sign a lease with a Section 8 tenant after the application has been approved. And that, that lease then gets submitted to the housing authority for their approval. And what they're going to do is they're going to look at that rent, that rental amount. We'll call it $1,000 a month. And then they're going to look at what the tenant's income level is at that point. And they're going to verify who is paying which utilities. And some of the some of the housing authorities actually have different requirements as far as who's responsible for what utilities. You can fill out the form because there's, there's some paperwork that comes with the Section 8 tenant in addition to just the application and the lease that you're going to have to fill out. On that form, it'll, it'll essentially say, you know, who's paying water? Landlord, tenant, you check a box. Who's paying heat? Landlord, tenant, you check the box. Who's paying gas? Who's paying electric, et cetera? Garbage, you know, things of that nature. And you check those boxes. Depending on how those boxes are checked or whatever you work out with the tenant or whatever your policy is, that is going to, you know, hypothetically change what that allotment is that tenant is going to receive and if they're even approved to receive that amount from the housing authority. What I'm saying is if you have them paying all the utilities and let's say garbage pickup, water, you know, and the, the additional utilities that go with your rental, that may, depending on how much they're approved for, which a lot of times these Section 8 tenants come to you with a voucher and say, oh, I'm approved for a three-bedroom unit or a three-bedroom house or a three-bedroom apartment in the amount of 1200 a month. Well, that's great. That all sounds great if that's where your rental market is and that's the right pricing. But again, depending on how you set up those utilities with the tenant, that number could change based on their income. Section 8, depending on the housing authority, is a supplement for their housing, and it's not necessarily 100% of all the costs that need to be paid for them to live in that house. It depends on their income level. So let's set that straight right now. A tenant can have a job, can, C-A-N, can have a job and make good money as a Section 8 uh, applicant and still get Section 8 supplementation. If they're making a considerable amount of money, or we'll call them uh, maybe still below the, the poverty level for the average in that county or that community, but they are still making money, Section 8 may only advocate for 50 to 75% of what their total rent is for that unit. So again, we'll go back to our example of $1,000. You may be getting $750 uh, from that tenant, or I'm sorry, from Section 8. The tenant would then be responsible for the water, garbage, sewer, electric, heat, gas, however your, uh, whatever those responsibilities are that you've assigned to the tenant through that lease. And again, it gets a little tricky because you've approved them based on the fact that they are, they've been allocated, let's say, a a $1,200 voucher is what they call it. But then when you fill out the paperwork, you realize or you'll be told by the Section 8 authority after you've already executed a lease that they're going to be getting X number of dollars Section 8 payment, let's say $750 on a $1,000 a month rental. And then they're responsible for $250 of that plus the additional utility costs. 
Now, the good thing about those issues are obviously the utilities are going to go into their name. They're going to be responsible for any cost that they incur. So if they're going to, you know, run their heat at 90 degrees every day in the winter and, you know, essentially rack up those gas bills, you know, they're going to be responsible for that. If the gas gets shut off, they're going to be responsible for that. But he is based on Section 8 based on the decision of the housing authority there are cities like chicago that will pay 100 percent of the rental amount in addition to 100 percent of the utility costs those situations do exist as well so i think the key point i'm making here is it's not always cut and dry it's not black and white you need to contact the housing authority again a, a governing body typically understaffed sometimes difficult to get a hold of someone the best way to communicate with them honestly is via phone because they are typically not very responsive via email even though they have these electronic systems set up and they do have contact methods if you have questions about an applicant before you even sign the lease I would be contacting whoever represents them in the housing authority side. They're typically assigned to a caseworker, and the caseworker's role is to help find them housing in addition to evaluation of that particular person who is receiving the Section 8 benefit. So, you know, you need to get a hold of them, find out what the situation is and what that voucher means for wherever, uh, whatever area that you're currently uh, renting in or where that, that property is that you're renting out. Because, again, it, 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 it could change. There's no such thing as Section 8 always pays 100% of everything all the time. Uh, that I'm sure of, even differing by county. Like I said, in Chicago, there are situations where they pay 100% of everything, and then there are situations where they're only paying 50%. It just depends on that tenant themselves. If they are granted the Section 8 benefit, then they, they essentially are, are eligible for Section 8 until they uh, either – have a complete lifestyle change or, you know, change income levels dramatically or they're kicked out of the program, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But, you know, the Section 8 benefit is essentially based on how much money they're making. And what that means is if you hire, I'm sorry, if you hire, if you rent to a tenant, well, it is kind of like hiring, right? Because they're paying your, uh, they're paying down your mortgage for you. So you're hiring somebody to make payments for you on your behalf to your own benefit, which is awesome. If you rent out to a tenant that is working at, let's say, Costco for $10 an hour, and they are promoted to, you know, stock shelf supervisor or whatever their position is at wherever it happens to be, and they, and they are now making $14 an hour, it may not kick in automatically, and it typically won't, but they do get periodically reevaluated by Section 8, and their supplement will change because they are now making more money. Section 8 is going to lower the amount of voucher benefit that they're receiving monthly for housing. I believe the ultimate goal essentially is to uh, help work with uh, individuals who need some financial assistance and guidance. So therefore, when they do start to generate more income, Section 8's job is to essentially, you know, show them how to budget correctly and, you know, pay for their responsibilities so eventually they can come out of that program. So again, keep that in mind. I've had tenants that have taken a second job because they're just not making enough money and I'm getting $1,000 a month from Section 8 and then they take a second job and three months later when the valuation happens to happen, which I'm not sure how often that is, it's going to vary by county or housing authority because uh, I've seen it on different, I've seen it where they've reevaluated tenants monthly and I've seen it where they've done it annually. At minimum, it's an annual reevaluation of their income. Uh, but that said, you know, they've dropped my Section 8 benefit that I've been receiving as a landlord from $1,000 down to $500, which is fairly dramatic. Now, at that point, that application becomes a lot more important, right? Because you essentially may have rented to that tenant with the thought in mind that you're going to be getting rent no matter what uh, for that amount of, let's say, $1,000. But if they take the next step and start, you know, moving towards a better future for themselves to generate more income, Section 8 reevaluates, and all of a sudden now you're only getting 50% of that, and the tenant is now responsible for the balance. Again, so can be a little more tricky than is typically what's out there in the, in the investor world of Section 8. I'm kind of diving in a little bit more on how it really works. And, you know, another reason why that's important is because if we take our first example of a $1,000 a month rental, actually, you know what? Forget that. We're going to go real life example. 
real Section 8 tenant situation. I've got a property in the area here in Chicago where I have it rented for $950 per month. It's a two-bedroom, one-bath, single-family house I bought during the downturn for like $12,500 back in like 2010. It was like the cheapest house I ever bought. It's awesome. Great property. Fixed it up, put like twenty five grand into this property or so. It was somewhat of a challenging rental. It has no garage. It does have a basement, but the house is 100 years old. It's sitting on a river rock foundation. It's a little moist in the basement, we'll call it. I mean, it's not like there's... Uh, the the great flood water is opening up every time it rains, but it's an old house. It's an old basement. I bought it knowing that I was going to have moisture, potentially water, water in that basement when it rained real hard, and, and it does, and it's not a big deal. I mean, the tenant's made aware of it. There's still washer dryer down in the basement, but essentially it's storage. It's kind of one of those, kind of like a deep, dark, creepy cellar is the best way to put it. And I've, you know, told the tenant, you're going to put anything down there, make sure you've got it up, you know, you've got it up high or you got it on a shelving rack or something because, you know, the mo- there is a possibility that you're going to get some water. It's never been a serious issue. I've owned this house now for five, six years, like I said. Well, I don't want to get too specific, but because, you know, this is someone's personal financial situation we're discussing. I rented that place out for nine fifty. dollars um, The supplementation I'm getting is $722 per month. So I'm responsible for collecting that additional 200 and was it $228? Now, let's just be realistic. $228, I don't know if I get out of bed in the morning for $228 once a month and chasing down this tenant when, when perhaps they can only come up with half of that amount on the first or the fifth of the month. I mean, the real life situation is in any situation, you're going to be busy. You've got your business to run. You're a real estate investor. Of course, that $200 is important. I'm not trying to minimize that amount or that dollar amount. Or I'm, and I'm also not trying to say that $200 doesn't mean something to me. What I'm telling you is that typically, I guess it really depends on what stage of your investing you're in and how much business you're doing. Because I typically touch base with that tenant monthly. I find out the status of that additional $200 plus that I'm owed. And I let a lot slide if she can't get it to me right away. I'll say, okay, well, how about on the uh, 15th? You have it by the 15th. Oh, yeah, I'll have it on the 18th of the month. Okay, great. Can you please, can we meet up on the 18th? Can you drop it off at the office? Can I come pick it up? I mean, it's, and this is not my only Section 8 rental and not the first time I've dealt with Section 8. It can be a constant challenge to try to chase that additional money. Now, are you going to evict somebody when you're receiving you know, 75% of the rent consistently from Section 8 that you know is going to continue, hmm, that'd be a personal decision. Some people are a lot more hard-ass than I am, perhaps. But I'll be honest, in that particular situation that I noted and the purchase price, the, the, the all-in cost I have on that property, if I happen to not get my $200, you know, for a month, I don't lose any sleep over it. What I do is I keep track of that number and I keep the tenant apprised of, hey, guess what? You know, now you owe me... 460 some dollars or 476 dollars for this month because you didn't pay last month or I didn't get a chance to collect it. So the, the, the good thing about a good Section 8 tenant is they're aware of the fact that they need to pay you that money. They're not trying to avoid it. They're not trying to skirt on it. They're just either having difficulties or they can't come up with it at that point and you can work them into payment plans. In my, in my particular situation, I've had this particular tenant just pay me a hundred to two hundred dollars every two weeks when she is able to do that, and that's only when things get bad on her end. For example, Christmas time comes around. I'm pretty much going to guarantee that I'm not going to get my December or January rent right away. So I typically pre-plan for that. Uh, during the spring, summer, and fall months, things are a little bit easier to collect. But again, these tenants are in that situation for a reason. Uh, typically, they're not. I shouldn't say typically. In some cases, they're not able to budget correctly. They overspend or underspend. They make decisions for their finances based on different types of motivation than maybe you or I would. So I just want to make everyone aware that Section 8 is great. You're getting your, you're getting most of the time, you're getting the majority of your rental payment paid directly through direct deposit by the housing authority, but there normally is a portion, and again, that can depend on the tenant and that can change. There normally is a portion that's going to be required to be paid by that tenant, even if it's just utilities. Now, 
Let's go to the, the other side of how Section 8 can work. I've heard people say, well, Section 8's great because every year Section 8 comes in, they do an annual inspection of the property, and they're coming out essentially to do this annual inspection of the property, and it's all safety-related issues. You know, are railings loose or are outlets uh, working correctly? They're checking for uh, ground fault and eruption, you know, GFI protection in the right areas. Never anything that I've seen as, as too dramatic. Well, and they're also trying to keep the property in, in, in somewhat decent operating shape on, for your benefit as well. And why I say that is because not only is there a requirement for the landlord of the property to, to maintain that, that asset in a, in a safe and uh, decent living condition, it's also the tenant's responsibility. So real life scenario, I have another tenant who has had a few boyfriends, we'll call it, over the last couple of years. And in her situation, she's uh, done some damage to the property. I don't know who did it. I would only be making assumptions, but there's been some holes in bedroom doors. There's been some holes in walls. I believe a mirror was broken in the bathroom. Well, when the Section 8 inspection occurred, I was not present. Uh, the tenant themselves met the inspector or, or let the inspector in. And they came back and actually cited the tenant to make certain repairs. Now, what's interesting about that situation, and this is something I want everyone to listen to very carefully, what's interesting about the situation is they told me I had to repair the front door. There was a, a weather stripping issue with the front door of this property. That was the only thing that I was responsible for as the owner slash landlord of the property. There was about two or three other repairs that the tenant was responsible for. I believe there was a, a couple holes in some walls, a couple holes in some bedroom doors, as well as a cracked mirror, which she was uh, responsible for having to replace. Now, I don't know if the Section 8 inspector said, well, what happened to the mirror? And she said, oh, I you know, cracked it on accident one day. I banged my head into it. You know, I don't know. But they made her responsible for that aspect, in addition to the holes in the doors, which clearly was her fault, as well as the holes in the walls. Uh, and these, this was all minor stuff. We're not talking about, you know, half of a door missing here. We're talking about just, you know, small baseball size, you know, doorknob bangs into the wall too hard. There's a hole in the wall. They made it resp her responsibility to repair it. They gave a 45 day notice essentially stating that the tenant is responsible and she had 45 days to make these repairs at her expense. Great. I thought, Hmm, that was a first for me. I'll be honest. I'm like, okay, cool. So she's going to make these repairs. I talked to her about it. She said she's got someone that she's going to have help her. And I thought, okay, well, no big deal. We're talking about some very minor drywall fixes. And again, with the, with the bedroom, the bedroom door is not a big deal. The mirror, I told her where she could get a mirror, you know, and you can go to a big box store and grab yourself a, a small bathroom mirror for less than $20. I told her I would even help her hang the mirror. So what happened in the real world after that fact is she failed to do any of those repairs minus the mirror, which I said I would help her with, or I would take care of for her. I had my guys go in there and repair the weather stripping on the door that I was required to complete. And I had them hang the mirror, rehang the mirror uh, that was cracked. And she still hadn't done the drywall work. My guys were even willing to do the drywall work. Well, that's why I went bad. I said, no, don't worry about it. That's her responsibility. She did the damage. I'm not worried about it right now. You know, if the unit turns over, we're going to have to do some work anyway. I'm not worried about a little bit of minor drywall repair, even though you're there. Uh, well, Section 8 came back, reinspected 45 days later, and guess what? Nothing was done other than the mirror and the door. So I was off the hook because the door was fixed. That's the front door weather stripping. And she had one box checked off of her list, which was the mirror which I also did. And then I received a notice a few days later stating that Section 8 would, will be terminating their supplementation until these repairs are made and that the tenant was responsible for the rent. And I'm like, what? I'm like, how? What did I do? I'm like, what did I do? I'm like, I should have just fixed the freaking drywall. It would have taken those guys less than an hour for a couple of holes the size of doorknobs in walls. Nothing could be more agitating. Section 8 did, in fact, stop making the next month's rental payment. 
Not only that, in the Section 8 paperwork they sent me, they specifically in bold, large print stated that I could not issue any type of notice to evict the tenant. And by state law, I, I was basically prohibited from evicting the tenant for non-payment of rent, even though Section 8 was no longer paying and the tenant was responsible. So now my hands are tied. And maybe a lot of people already knew this about Section 8. I didn't know that. I didn't know they could do that. But guess what? They can. So I'm not saying you need to jump in there and fix everything a tenant breaks. You need to keep the place up. You don't want to be a slumlord. I mean, maybe there are, some lords probably make a lot of money in some different areas. I can't speak on you know how that would work. I try to keep my properties nice and clean. And if the tenant's going to fix something, I let them fix it. Even on my stuff that I'm running out now, there's times where tenants say, hey, I'd really love to paint this room you know, purple. And I say, that's fine. Paint it whatever you want. But it's got to be white again when you leave. Actually, I use a gray, like an off-white gray color. But you, know, you got you to paint it again when you leave. Okay. I mean, I don't mind if they're going to make improvements or they're going to change, make changes to the property as long as it's in the, you know, in the same condition as when they rented it. So I wasn't that concerned. But that said, yeah, so I got screwed out of like two months of Section 8 payment for that particular rental, um, which, which was a little upsetting. Uh, the tenant did make the fixes after that point. Still took some time. Uh, but again, I lost two months. And Section 8 now... Let's circle all the way back around. Now you're telling, now you're saying to me, well, that really sucks. I'm really, and now I'm more scared of how it would work with a Section 8 tenant. And what happened was, is once the uh, repairs were made and they came back for a third time to inspect the property to approve the repairs, Section 8 actually did refund me those months of their portion of the payment minus whatever she paid to me. Uh, which I had to verify through Section 8, essentially, with receipts, which, by the way, was zero. So that was easy. Uh, and they verified that with the tenant as well. So I did get my two months after the fact. But, again, that's three, four months later. It was a pain in the butt. So lesson learned on that end. If I get another Section 8 inspection, which, again, happens annually on each property that I have that might be Section 8, which I only have a handful that are Section 8, but... I'm going to stay all over that tenant to make sure if they're responsible for any of those repairs that they're doing them or probably just the easier route and spending an extra 50 bucks, maybe a hundred, depending on what the repair is, just have whoever, just have my contractor fix whatever it is that needs to be fixed. That's just my train of thought, right or wrong. Now, moving on from section eight, this is probably one of the things I want to, I want to start to wrap up with is you can... C-A-N, again, can discriminate against Section 8. You can't discriminate on family, religion, race, sex, marital status, uh, gender, handicap. No discrimination there. Technically, at least in Illinois, the only way you can discriminate against any of those classes is if you physically live in the property with that tenant. Meaning if you're in a duplex and you're on one side of it, you are technically allowed in Illinois to discriminate against those protected classes because you are living in the property. Now, that said, we're not even going to go there. I don't even want to know any more about that because I don't want my name tied to saying how you can discriminate, but you can also discriminate against Section 8. So, I mean, I wouldn't be blatantly obvious about it, but that's why, as a landlord, you do get phone calls like, hey, do you, do you take Section 8? Well, a lot of landlords that maybe haven't dealt with Section 8 either say no or, uh, I don't know, maybe. How, you know, how does that work? We're returning back full circle here at this point, and that goes back to really talking to that tenant and then talking to the caseworker to find out what particular level of voucher they're receiving. And I, I and you need to verify that number because they essentially show up at the door and they say, I get $1,500 a month. Well, that's potentially their last situation. Now that they're moving, that is going to change, potentially. There could be a benefit to that to you. There was a tenant uh, looking at some of my listings or my, I'm sorry, my rental properties that uh, we're currently working with, with one of our leasing agents that was uh, receiving a four bedroom voucher from section eight. And that amount was $1,709 per month. Uh, that's $1,709 for a four bedroom voucher. She, I think she had three kids. Well, the property she's looking at typically are only renting for fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars, even as a, as a four bedroom. So in her case, you know, you you potentially might be receiving more than what your rent is. Or when they adjust that number, 
I believe you know she's entitled to the maximum of seventeen hundred and nine dollars. You're you're potentially still going to get that full amount if you're renting at fifteen hundred dollars, and you're not going to have to chase the tenant to collect that cash every month. So before I wrap up, and we have all the critics that jump all over me for talking about uh, Section Eight and collecting cash rents from them, and oh, you have to vet out the tenant and yada yada yada. Yeah, I totally understand that. I'm just giving you some of my experiences that I've had with I've had. Great situations with Section 8 where they pay me religiously on the first of the month, typically still in cash, but every month on time, and Section 8 makes their payment every month on time. Maybe there's a hiccup here and there, and it's never really a big concern. I've had the opposite side where you're chasing tenants, and I wanted to bring those to light because I wanted to talk a little bit about to Section 8 or to not Section 8. The good, bad, and the ugly, you just got it. I'm sure there's a lot more we could discuss. I know there's books written on it. I know there's a book written by Mike McLean called The Section 8 Bible. He's actually got two volumes out. As far as I know, there might be more than one now. Let's see. I'm actually looking at it right now. Michael McLean and Nick Cipriano. I'm looking at the volume two right now out of the two books I'm aware that he's written, and that was from 2007. So... There is some good information out there about Section 8 in addition to what I'm telling you. I, I encourage you to seek that out if you have more questions on how Section 8 works. Again, there's one other thing you can consider before you even rent to Section 8 is all of their programs and the information for your area that you might own a property in are available typically online. They're, we'll call it their rule book. And I've, I actually heard this on a podcast, so I don't want to steal the idea, but it's a great idea. You can essentially... Get a copy of that that Section 8 rule book, uh, let's say in Chicago from the Chicago Housing Authority, or the Housing Authority of uh, Cook County is who actually mandates what happens in Chicago, and they will send you their 150-page you know guide on how on what what the program is and how it works and what the requirements are and what the inspections are. I mean, what you know again everything down to smoke detector batteries and how far they need to be away from bedroom doors. So you can help kind of do a preemptive strike in advance if you are looking to Section 8 or you're open to either option, which I always am personally. There might be certain properties that I, I'm not so interested in dealing with a Section 8 tenant on. There might be others where I'm a little more interested or expecting a Section 8 tenant on just based on maybe some of the uses of the property. Again, my example, that house I bought for uh, $12,500 was only a two-bedroom, one-bath. It's like 900 square feet or something, plus a basement, no garage. Just not ideal for a family, but perfect for a single individual, maybe with one child or something who happens to be on that program. I mean, I am 100% happy with the fact that that's going to be a Section 8 uh, rental, maybe forever. That's a great point. I'm just going to jump in, even though I was wrapping up. Section 8 tenants do have a tendency to move less and stay longer. And I can't tell you the exact psychology behind it. I'm sure there's greater minds that have an awesome explanation as to why. My thought process is if I'm really not responsible for paying for the full nut on my house every month or my rental payment, then maybe I really don't care where I live as much. As long as I've got a decent place that's in good shape and right, water dripping on my clothes and all my stuff, I'm pretty cool with it. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm thinking about that property right now. I think I mentioned it earlier. I've had the same tenant in there for like five years. At one point, there was some discussion over moving out. That never happened, and I keep getting rent, so I'm happy. One last thing to note about Section 8 is they will only allow, and I'm speaking now for Illinois. It could be different somewhere else. They will only allow a one-year lease for the tenant. You cannot sign multi-year leases with tenants at least not as of two weeks ago when this was the last time I spoke to a caseworker about a new rental I have that might be a Section 8 or might be going Section 8 for, from a tenant or through a tenant. So one-year lease, and then what happens typically, they automatically go on month to month uh, after that. So you're going to be getting that same rental amount, but they're then not committed to that one-year lease, and you essentially have to – either party has to give a 30-day notice in order to – notify the other of vacating that property. So if the landlord does want that tenant to move out, 30-day notice. If the tenant wants to move out, 30-day notice. You also can re-sign a new lease for another year after that fact. Um, but again, I don't know the exact psychology as to why, but the longevity factor seems to be one of the goods of dealing with Section 8. So 
I think that was a pretty comprehensive explanation of at least my experience with Section 8 tenants. I can't believe I filled like 30 some minutes full of that stuff. I guess I do talk too much. I look forward to having some more podcasts out there soon. I'm going to a convention in Ohio this week. I should have some awesome guests on different perspectives from different areas of the Midwest and the country. You know, have some great information for you guys. So please rate us on iTunes, go on Stitcher, listen to us, go on my YouTube channel. Please, you know, help me out. Give me some feedback. And uh, again, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Investor Empowerment Series radio show. Be sure to tune in next week for another empowering episode. We welcome your feedback, so please rate us on iTunes and Stitcher. And visit us at www.investorempowermentchicago.com or tannisgrouprealty.com. 